My name is Nate Wong. I serve as the managing director at the Beck Center. Um, so for those of you who may not know, the Beck Center, we're all about scaling social innovation. Um, and the way we do that is work with students um, across the university to train them on ways to do just that. Uh, we also have a stable of a dozen or more fellows that are associated with the Beck Center who are experts in finance, they're experts in data and civic voice. And this is really the crux of what the Beck Center does in guiding our work. Um, we ask audacious questions um, and we seek to, to really come together to formulate some of those answers. So for us tonight, we are so fortunate um, to hear from Ann May Chang. She's a leading advocate for social innovation and author of the book that we'll be discussing more tonight, Green Impact. Anne May's experience includes leading mobile engineering, specifically apps and services across platforms at Google, and more no notably, notably, serving as the chief innovation officer at the US Agency for International Development. She has sought to bring best practices for innovation from Silicon Valley to accelerate impact and scale of solutions to the world's most intractable problems. Um, so Anne May is a friend of the Beck Center. She serves as a board member um, at Beck uh, for the past year and a half, and she's been so helpful to us um, as we plan our future at the Beck Center. Um, so with her help, we've honed our work and the focus at our center, which I'm sure we'll talk more about later today, um, on outcomes for individuals and society. Um, so to invest in outcomes, we believe we need to be audacious. Uh, we need to think differently, we need to behave differently, and we need to collaborate differently. Uh, we need to ask those tough questions to challenge um, ourselves to be fearless as we tackle the messy, um, the messy notion of changing the rules of the game. Um, so Anne May is all about creating those new rules. So I'm so excited to hear from her. Um, briefly, logistically, after a short presentation from Anne May, um, she'll be joined by the state, she'll be joined on stage by our, our executive director, Sonal Shah, um, who will lead our conversation tonight. We will also quickly open it up for questions, so be prepared with your questions. Um, and then we'll also have a book signing afterwards. So without further ado, please give a warm Hoya welcome to Anne May Chang. Thank you everyone for coming out on an evening here. Um, so I a, want to start with a question. How many of you feel like that despite all our enormous efforts, that we're just not making enough of a dent on the problems that plague our society. Anyone else feel that way? Okay, most of you, I certainly do. And this is, I would argue, exactly why we need social innovation. So one of the books that has really done a great job of capturing the best practices of innovation that come out of Silicon Valley and has led to this incredible pace of progress in Silicon Valley is The Lean Startup by Eric Reed. And Eric talks about the Lean Startup as a methodology to, for building products and services under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Now you can imagine in Silicon Valley in the tech world, if you're a tech startup, you're working in incredible uncertainty because you're trying to work with cutting edge technologies, building business models and products and services that have never been tried before. And we all know that like nine out of 10 startups fail as a result. Well, I would argue that this is equally if not more true for social challenges. That, um, and, and there's an incredible amount of uncertainty because problems seem to only be getting more complex, more intertwined, more enmeshed, and we're just not making enough progress. And so, so we need innovation just as much for social good, and yet, too often I feel like we're just bringing the wrong tools to the table. So in cases where we have solutions that we know will work and we know can scale, it makes absolute sense to do what we tend to do, which is focus on predictable execution. How do we deliver whatever, whatever intervention or um, product or service to do good in the world? But much more often, 
what I found, is that we're tackling big, complex problems where we have more questions than we have answers. And in those situations, we need to take a different approach, one that emphasizes the speed of learning. And that's what social innovation is about. And yet, when I talk to leaders who are working for social good, many of them have heard of the Lean Startup or other innovation tools and techniques and see the potential for these in the work that they're doing, but quickly they get stuck. They struggle to figure out how to make this, these tools apply in the work that they do where they have highly restrictive funding or where social impact can be very difficult to measure and take years to realize or where the whole notion of experimentation can feel irresponsible when you're talking about working with vulnerable populations. And that's really why I wrote this book, Lean Impact, is to look at, uh, to, to look at how we can adapt these best practices of innovation that have worked in the business world, or, or working around the world, and bring them to these problems that matter most by putting, bringing forward the stories of organizations that have found paths to um, addressing these and other challenges. And so, in the process of writing the book, I was lucky to get to interview over 200 different organizations, both big and small, domestic and international, nonprofit and for-profit, funders and implementers, and try to learn from the best, the ones who are most successful. What were the secrets to their success? And three themes really stood out that I distilled down as three principles for Lean Impact. I want to share those three with you today. The first is to think big. Just as Nate said, innovation starts with an audacious goal. What I found is when it comes to social impact, too often we think too small. We plan within the constraints of we have this much funding, we have this many people, we have a grant opportunity of this size and scope, and we look at these constraints and we say, what can we do? And we can usually do some good, but most often, we all, we're only scratching the surface. We're barely moving the needle on the bigger problem. And so instead, I think we need to start by setting an audacious goal, one that is based not on the constraints that we're currently faced with, but the needs that actually exist in the world. Let me give you an example of what um, let me put that a little bit in perspective. So um, in global development, some of the things that we've worked on are things like access to clean water, electricity, and sanitation. Over the last 30 years, we've made slow but steady progress on each of these areas. And we say that we, it's hard to do better than this because we're working with people who are very poor in very remote areas, so it's gonna be a long, hard slog. And yet, in these same areas, with these same people, adoption of mobile phones has skyrocketed. So what's the difference here? There's a couple that stand out to me. One is that mobile phones are something that people really, really want. Um, I hear stories all the time about how people will top up their mobile phone before they'll buy food because it helps them keep, stay connected with their loved ones, access economic opportunities, stay informed about what's happening in the world. And so today, more people have a mobile phone than a toilet. On the supply side, the companies that, the manufacturers that create mobile phones, they're able to sell the phones, they make a profit from that, and they can invest that in R&D to create better and cheaper phones and distribute them to more remote areas. The telecom companies to um, provide uh, certain mobile services, they're able to sell minutes, sell airtime, and then as a result, they're able to invest more in building more cell towers, expanding service, reducing, you know, getting economies of scale. And so through this combination of strong demand and a real driver for supply, we see this kind of um, trajectory. And I would argue that in the realm of social impact, we should be aiming for this kind of result. Certainly not everything's gonna look like that, but we need to aim big if we hope to get there. Um, and just to give an example of that, I want to share the story of a nonprofit called EARN. It's based in San Francisco, and they set out to focus on low-income Americans, help build a habit of savings. And 
after 10 years in business, they were being given awards and recognized by their field as one of the most successful micro savings providers with 7,000 micro savings accounts. But one day the founder, Ben Mangan, woke up and he thought, there's 50 to 70 million people who could benefit from what we're doing. We're barely scratching the surface. We need to do more. And so soon thereafter at an awards dinner, he stood up and made this crazy pledge that they were going, that earn was going to reach a million people in the next five years. Now, they had gotten to 7,000 people in 10 years, so that was a huge stretch. But by putting that stake in the ground and challenging the organization to say, how are we going to make reach a million people? Because that's what's required to make a difference here. It forced them to completely rethink their model. It was no, not going to be realistic for them to make a financial match for everybody's savings account. It also wasn't going to be realistic for them to make in-person visits to each of their clients. Instead, they built an online platform that, so that they could reach a lot more people a lot more cheaply. And in their first year after launching the platform, they reached 85,000 people, more than 10 times as many as they reached in their first 10 years alone. Now, the answer is not always technology. Sometimes people j jump to that conclusion. But whatever the solution is, we're not going to get there unless we really set ourselves, our sights high enough that forces us to think out of the box and look for solutions that can get us there. So the second principle of lean impact is to start small. Too often we think too small, but start too big. Once we have that big audacious goal, we have a potential solution, we just start executing. You know, because there's people who are suffering today that we, we feel we want to help as quickly as possible, or we have funders breathing down our backs, or we just want to see results, and so we just start delivering as much as we can. But in my experience, by starting small, we can make a far bigger impact over time because it gives us time to learn. When there, where you, again, again, if you have a solution that works, delivering it is great, but too often we're delivering solutions that are subpar, that aren't effective enough or aren't scalable enough. And so what I found when we're working towards social good is that organizations in this space love to plan. We spend a lot of time planning, drawing up designs, having meetings, discussing the best way to do things. And by the time we deliver something, it's been a, a lot of time has passed, and we've built up a ton of risk. So many things could go wrong, because we live in a messy world that doesn't always behave the way we expect. And so when we do this, when we fail, we fail big. So instead, what if we got out much more quickly, learned by doing, put out smaller experiments to test how people are going to respond, test what's really going to happen, <clears throat> and learn from that. And when we fail, we can fail small. Learn from that, improve what we're doing, and get out again, and, and continue to iterate and improve so that we test and iterate our way to the final solution. And that's really at the essence of the of lean impact, is this notion of the build, measure, learn feedback loop. And this is not some, you know, some fancy new technique. This is essentially the scientific method, that you have a potential solution that you think will uh, make an impact, and you form a hypothesis about what you expect to happen when you deploy your solution. And then what you do simply is build an experiment, something Eric calls a minimum viable product, or MVP. That's the smallest, cheapest experiment you can run to learn something about whether your solution's on target to, to, hit your, to, to uh, deliver on your hypothesis. Then you measure, you gather the data. What happened? Did it work? Did it not work? What was the result? And then you learn. If it worked, then that's fantastic. Now it makes sense to double down, do more at a higher fidelity or reaching more people. If it didn't work, maybe you learned something about what you could tweak and improve and try again. Or you might realize you're off target entirely and need to pivot and take a different path altogether. Now, we all do this, of course, but the secret is for innovation is real, the driver is the speed through, the, through this loop. Oftentimes, our iteration cycles on the order of months or years, where we go out there, we run a pilot project for a year or two, we then run a randomized control trial to see if it worked, 
and it's years later before we find out if something worked. Part of the secret to Silicon Valley's success is they've learned how to have these iterations get down to days or even hours. And so if we want to innovate, if we want to learn and improve, the speed of our iteration is going to be key in getting there. And when it comes to social innovation, it's not enough for us to deliver on the traditional things that we do in the, in, in the business world, where we focus on value, which is, is this a product or service that the customers really want and will demand and come back for? And growth, which is, is there a driver, an engine that will accelerate growth over time to reach the potential people who could benefit? But also impact, which is simply, does it work? Does it deliver on the social benefit that we're aiming for and, and to the degree that we need? And so when we're experimenting to test for social, uh, social innovation, what we want to do is look at our hypotheses around value, growth, and impact and test each of them to ensure that we really are delivering because we need to deliver on all three of these in order to succeed. Let me give an example of each of them. First, on value, which is usually where we start. Because if nobody wants what we have to offer, we're not going to get very far. So Copia Global is a social enterprise in Kenya. And they set out to, uh, with the goal of providing a much wider range of consumer goods to people living in rural Kenya. And they started out with this, uh, with this idea of a solution of providing, um, being the Amazon of Kenya, of providing products through a catalog that people could order. But rather than setting up warehouses and transportation infrastructure, hiring a bunch of agents, and investing a lot of money and time on their infrastructure, they decided to run an MVP. Their MVP consisted of the CEO, Crispin, going to a bunch of, uh, going, going to the sort of supermarkets or the Walmart equivalent or Nakumat in, in Nairobi, taking a bunch of pictures of products that he thought people might be interested in, pasting them into a handful of catalogs and giving them out to a few people, and then sitting back to see what would happen. It took all of a few days. And what happened was people started placing orders. Their first hypothesis was validated. People would order from a catalog. And when they ordered from the catalog, he himself would go to the store, buy the product off the shelves, and hand carry it and deliver it to the village. Now this is certainly not something that would ever scale, but it's something that he was able to get run, up and running in the order of days to figure out if people were even interested. Because if no one was going to order from the catalog, you would have wasted a lot of time. They also learned a lot of other new interesting things. One is what kind of products would people order from the catalog? Um, it turned out that it turns out that one of their most popular products is cement or concrete, which is the one that you buy. I always get confused between the two. Um, so so it, it, you know, when I thought about you know, consumer products that people would buy, it certainly didn't occur to me that would be cement. But it makes sense, because it's really heavy. And if you don't have a car, it's difficult for you to transport home. So it became very popular. And that has huge implications for the kind of business and infrastructure they need to set up. The third thing they learned was that they were curious what kind of agents would be effective at selling from the catalog. And it turned out that their initial hypothesis was false. They thought that the corner store owners, like the sort of kiosk owners who were selling the basic consumer staples, would be great um, agents. But it turned out they were terrible agents because they were much more interested in selling the goods that they had already on inventory in their shops. Instead, the people that ended up making the best agents were people who ran complementary businesses, like a hair salon, where when people would come in to get their hair cut, they'd be waiting you know, their turn, and they could flip through the catalog and order things, and it would be a complementary additional stream of income uh, for the business. And so by running this very simple, very cheap experiment, they learned a ton of things that had huge implications for how they built out the, the rest of their, um, their business going forward, and they continue to run experiments as a result. Finally, when it comes, uh, uh, the second dimension of uh, social innovation is impact. And impact, as I mentioned earlier, can be difficult to measure um, and take a long time to realize. And one of the areas where that's true is in education. Some at public schools 
set out with the idea of creating a school that would serve a diverse student population where 100% of the students would graduate from college. Now, they brought together the best practices for education that they could find, start, set up a charter school. Eight years later, when their first students graduated from college, they found that they were doing much better than ever. And they were getting all sorts of pressure to scale this model because, hey, this is better than what we have. But their founder, Diane Taverner, said, no, we're not ready to scale. We're, we're, our goal was 100% and we could do better. But she also said, we're not going to wait another eight years to change things and see if it works. We can't wait that long. That iteration cycle is just you know, not acceptable. And so instead, she decided to focus on building a culture of innovation into the organization. And they set up systems so that they could capture data every week based on student learning assessments, teacher feedback, and focus groups that would determine what was working and not. And over a 57 week period, they varied the mix of uh, teacher lectures, student group, small group projects, um, personalized learning on computers that were self paced learning. One-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring to try to figure out what was going to make the biggest difference and really improve students learning and each week based on what they learned they continued to improve and over the course of a year they really honed their revolutionary approach to personalized learning in the last year 99% of their graduates were accepted to college we'll see over time how they do on their graduation rate but their model is now being adopted by 300 public over 300 public schools across the United States and so even for something like education that takes a long time to realize, there's ways to find those early indicators that will allow you to experiment. And finally, once we have something that people want and that we know works, I think one of the places we fall down the most when it comes to social impact is scale. As Nate talks about, that's one of the reasons that the Beck Center exists, is that we're not getting enough of these great solutions to scale. But the journey to scale looks very different um, in the social impact world than it does in the private sector. Let me share the journey of Vision Spring to show you what that might look like. Vision Spring set out to focus on a 700-year-old invention that has been proven to increase productivity and learning potential. That's eyeglasses. Now, we often think of innovation as, you know, the bright, shiny new thing, but this is a 700-year-old invention. And yet, their estimates are like two and a half billion people who need eyeglasses don't have them. And they set out to fix that. So they started by focusing on two geographies, El Salvador and India, hired a bunch of people they called vision entrepreneurs to go out to rural areas and provide vision services. These folks came back with compelling stories of kids who were able to learn, um, adults who were able to work again, and many nonprofits would be thrilled that they were making a huge difference in these people's lives. But they realized that they were losing money with each person they reached, and they were never going to be able to get to much scale that way. So their first pivot was they decided to set up vision centers in more urban areas that would serve a more affluent population and use the profits to cross-subsidize outreach to more rural areas. And through this, they were, becoming, they were able to become financially self-sustainable. Now, what could be better? You're doing good and you're financially self-sustainable. There was one problem. It would have taken decades or even centuries for them to scale their infrastructure to reach everyone around the world that needed them. So their next pivot was they decided to partner. They partnered with an organization called BRAC in Bangladesh. That's a nonprofit that has community health care workers in every corner of the country and provided vision care services through them. And through this partnership, they've now been able to reach over a million people. And through additional partnerships, they've reached over four and a half million people. Now, they're doing good, financially self-sustainable, reaching millions of people. What could be better? Well, two and a half, four and a half million people is a tiny fraction still of two and a half billion people. And they realized that this was a systems problem. It was not something any one organization could do. They had, there, there were failures in the market where eyeglass manufacturers weren't motivated to um, invest in low cost enough eyeglasses and distributing them where governments were providing basic vision care services to their populations. And so they decided to set up something called the Eye Alliance to bring together eyeglass manufacturers and governments and nonprofits to work together on these systems issues. 
one of their first successes was the MOU they signed with the government of Liberia to integrate vision care into their public health and public school systems. And you can imagine through this type of approach of influencing policy, shaping markets, that they can eventually get to that two and a half billion number. Now Vision Springs path is only one path to scale, but it illustrates the kind of twists and turns involved in getting to scale and the kinds of things we need to reach beyond our normal modes of working in order to get there. And it all starts with that audacious goal, that two and a half billion number that they have continued to stay focused on has driven their decisions. So the last principle of lean impact is to relentlessly seek impact. Now this seems obvious, but I've seen so often that we lose sight of this in the work that we do. One issue is that we, t we forget to fall in love with the problem. Instead, we fall in love with our solution. Our solution, is, and that can be because we have pride of ownership over the thing we invented ourselves, or that we want to have a particular role for ourselves individually or for our organizations, or we're trying to find a way to use a particular technology that we think is really exciting. There's lots of reasons that this happens. Um, but I see too often that organizations get caught up. You know, one of the ways that I, I measure this is that I talk to lots of different nonprofits, many of whom work in the same sector, and every single one of me will tell me they have the best solution. And they can't all be right. So instead, what I think we need to focus on are the metrics that matter. Um, too often we focus on these metrics on the left um, that are um, what Eric calls vanity metrics. These are the absolute numbers of the number of people we reach, the number of dollars we raise, that are really the heartbeat of how many nonprofits work. But they don't actually tell you anything about whether you're making a difference. You could reach a lot of people, but did you improve their lives? And even if you did, could another organization with those same resources have done much more with more people? So instead, what I think we need to switch our focus to is what I call the innovation metrics on the right. And these are the unit level metrics on value, growth, and impact that look at the conversion rate, the adoption rate, the unit costs, the success rate, that really will, are the keys to driving impact over time. When we can optimize on these metrics, then we know we're making the biggest difference possible. And so I just want to close by saying, I think we need to raise the bar. In the private sector, companies are required to maximize shareholder value or maximize profits. In, this, in the world of social impact, we should hold ourselves to that same standard. We too easily let ourselves be satisfied by doing some good. I think what we need to do instead is hold ourselves and each other accountable for maximizing the impact and scale of our solutions. And to do so, we need to set those audacious goals and then start small by testing iterating and improving on the value, growth, and impact that we can deliver. Thank you. All right. I'll come on this side. OK. Um, I have so many questions, but let me just start with uh, Anne May. Uh, every day challenges me because she sits on my board about the Beck Center on a regular basis. And so what I thought I would start with, Anne May, is actually just applying it to myself, right? And to take the principles that you have said. And I, I do start that way. I think about it and I'm like, okay, what's the constraints of working at a university? And then what's the constraint of the funding that I have? And how many people do I have? And so one of the biggest challenges, you've pushed us on this, is Okay, so what's the strategy of the Beck Center? And I would love for you to just give the feedback of what you have told me. Because <laughs> I'm like, we do finance, we do data for social good, we do blah, blah, blah. And then your feedback was? Well, I, I <laughs> um, so Don't feel bad. <laughs> one of the things that we've discussed is, you know, a lot of the things that we talked about here is I think the Beck Center, like most organizations, focused on the what of that they're going to do. We're going to do finance, we're going to do data, we're going to do thing was, civic voice. Civic voice. Um, but these are the what's, right? And the question is, why are you doing these things? What, what is your goal? Because maybe those are the best things to do right. to get to the goal, and maybe they're not. 
Um, and the fact that we haven't achieved our social impact objectives yet means that we don't know the answers. Um, and so one of the things I've challenged is to really focus more on the why. Like, what is the goal that you're trying to achieve here? What does success look like? Um, and have that be the guiding star rather than the what of what you're going to do. Right. Nope. Uh, and it's been um, a journey. <laughs> uh, I think, I, and I think that's the important thing that I want to, I would love for you to talk about because you've talked to, you said you've talked to 200 organ, over 200 organizations. The ones you highlight in the book, you actually took some very specific time to understand why you picked them and what is it that they were doing differently that um, you picked on them. You, know, you, you chose those out of the number of, uh, of organizations you talked to. But how do you really think about, like, there's so many things we could do and you had to go start a strategy and I still got to run all the programs I'm running. And how did some of these organizations actually decide that they were going to focus on impact first? and really challenge the model because there's three scary things in this. One, uh, what if I have to cut out the programs that I'm working on and I shouldn't be doing them? Two, um, uh, what if our strategy's wrong? <laughs> uh, and what, is our, what are our donors gonna say? And three, then what if we're collecting, collecting the wrong metrics? Yeah. And I'm sure you heard that from some of those. Yeah, it's really tough. I, I really cast, you know, I talked to over 200 organizations, but I heard about hundreds more. Yeah. And uh, it's really tough. Um, the reason that a lot of these, everything in the, I'll tell you right now, everything in the Lean Impact book is common sense. Like none of it is going to be a surprise. The, what's tough is that it's really hard to apply common sense for social good because everything in the system pushes us to do something different. Right. Um, and so the people I found who have been the most successful are the ones who are incredibly brave who will turn down funding that doesn't give them the flexibility that they need or is you know, forcing them to focus on delivering on a predetermined plan that they know is not going to be sufficient, um, that, that really makes some trade-offs of the investing in the R&D and the experimentation that will get them to bend the curve in the long term versus deliver more results and numbers in the short term. And it takes a lot of bravery to do that. Yeah. Can you give us an example, and I'm going to pick the one that I want you to talk about, but Harambi, uh -huh. and uh, largely because she's a friend of ours. But, um, but like, tell us a little bit about what Harambi's been doing and how they approached kind of their own model, mm -hmm. because they're in your book, and, and you really talk about the, their approach. Yeah, so Harambi is a nonprofit in South Africa, and they set out to tackle this issue of youth unemployment which is a huge issue in South Africa. Something like 40% of youth are um, not in employment, education, or training. Um, and it's a growing problem in South Africa. And so they start out with this very audacious goal. Um, and they decided uh, there's a million youth training programs, both in the US and you know, South Africa and many other places. And most of them, what they focus on is like, how many youth did we train? The better ones focus on how many youth actually got jobs. What Arambe decided to focus on is they realized that in order for youth to be successful, they can't just get placed in the first job. They have to actually stay in the job. And, the, and there's data, that some research that shows that if a youth stays in a job for a full year, then they're likely to be employed through the course of their lifetime. Um, and so they realized that this metric of, of retention was incredibly important and that it wasn't enough to just train some youth and say, hey, we trained a lot of people. Um, and so they tracked retention took more work, but they would text the youth after they got jobs and check in to see what was going on with them. Um, and one of their early uh, things that they learned was they were placing youth in retail outlets, you know, sort of like a supermarket checkout clerk. Um, they tra trained the youth, they would go into the, they would get, be able to get these jobs, they would start the jobs, and they were found, found out that a lot of them were dropping out after a week or two. And so it made them go back and try and find out why. It turned out the youth just weren't comfortable standing all day. They had never done that before. They didn't realize that was what was going to be required. And they're like, this is not for me. I'm leaving. Um, and so that caused them to rethink their model. They decided to, to go back to their training and do their, tr their three-week training with the youth standing the whole time. So by the time they got to the, the grocery store and had to be standing, they were already used to it. And if they weren't going to be comfortable with that, they could drop out and figure out a different track to take. Um, and so it's, it's that focus on the long-term impact of what's really going to make a difference that um, I think really set Harambe apart. 
Yeah. Um, if you're a student, with, you know, at Georgetown today, and you are saying, what do I, how do I get involved in thinking about lean impact early? So I go work in an organization over the summer. They don't, they measure the vanity metrics. They don't really think about impact. How do, how do I think about it as I'm learning in the process? And what's a way to start learning? Yeah, so I think there's a, a number of things you can do um, to get started. Um, there's a lot of small steps to take that can make a huge difference. The one is just to ask the question, what, is, what, what does success look like? You know, force people around you to talk about that. Um, play devil's advocate a little bit. Again, it takes a little bit of bravery because sometimes people don't like to know the real answers. Um, but the other thing is to run experiments. Experiments can be incredibly cheap. If you have a program that you're going to promote, create two versions of the flyer with different ways that you, um, you might pitch the program, different benefits that you might uh, be offering to people, and see which one attracts the most interest. It's a very simple, cheap way to learn something. And as you do these kind of small experiments, you'll start learning. And when you can bring those results back to your organization and say, hey, you know, I just went out for a couple hours this afternoon to the mall, and I you know, tried this experiment. I, I, you know, offered these things, and this is what this is what the response was. Ten times as many people liked this version. Like that's real data. That's something that's actionable. Yeah. And I think just those small steps can of getting that data um, that helps you know r root the your decisions in reality rather than debates in the conference room um, are a huge step that you can move forward that anyone can do. And, and you know, like you could come. <coughs> Many of us worked in large organizations. Many of us worked in are working in large organizations. Um, we want to start the process in our own organization, but uh, it's hard. It's hard to convince your bosses. It's hard to convince others that we should be testing these out. How do we do that? How, what are some models or what are some examples of what you have seen of where initiatives started with, within groups of people trying something? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a sort of broad question. I'm trying to think of a good example of this. I think that, like I said, anyone can go run an experiment. Um, but I think it's, it's getting agreement on what really matters that is hard. Um, I, in your program? Yeah, in your, your program. A lot so of the USAID, we ran programs. Yes, we ran a bunch of different programs. But uh, what, what I found a lot of times is that organizations don't have agreement on what matters, like what does success look like. And asking that question can really make a big difference. And then being willing to think outside of the box to try something that could move the needle there. Um, I'm not thinking of a great example right off the top of my head of, um, of someone taking the initiative to do that within an organization. But I, I think a lot of times what happens is the uh, is that people try to, because there's so much buzz around innovation, I have lots of examples of how people decide to innovate because that's like the cool thing to do that everyone's supposed to do. Um, and there's all these innovations floating around. I was just talking to an organization today who were talking about, we have all these innovations floating around and like they neither succeed or fail. And so I asked the question, well, do you, what are you trying to achieve? And nobody knew what they were trying to achieve. So of course, like you can't succeed or fail. And so the innovations are just cool ideas that are out there. And I think all too often that's what I see in terms of innovation is like the cool ideas that we're not actually sure what they're trying to do. Um, and innovation doesn't have to be a bright, shiny new thing. It can be a very small tweak to um, a process, to how you pitch something, to um, the people that you engage that makes all the difference. Yeah, it's it's um, it's vision spring. The innovation wasn't eyeglasses. Exactly. <laughs> it was how you were distributing the eyeglasses or who could distribute the eyeglasses. Yeah, and I think we tend to conflate the notions of invention and innovation. Invention is that new idea. And invention is absolutely essential to happen. Someone had to invent eyeglasses, right? But invention, uh, I love this Edison quote that I'm sure you've heard me talk about before. Edison said, um, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And so that 1% is that big idea. But the 99% 
is the blood, sweat, and tears it takes to take that germ of a new idea and make it practical, um, make it adoptable, make it scalable, um, to get it out to the world so that it actually um, reaches people. You know, Edison had tried like a thousand different filaments for his light bulb before he came up with, I mean, there were lots of light bulbs before, but he came up with one that could be commercially viable. Right. Um, and it took a thousand experiments to get there. And that one that people wanted to buy. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, much like you, I've seen enough of these over time where, you know, my favorite one is cook stoves, where we've built the 8,000th version of a cook stove and uh, people don't want to buy them. Yeah, because we think we're solving a problem. This is a classic thing where we're designing something in a conference room here in the United States for people saying, hey, what people really need is this clean cook stove because it won't damage the environment and it won't lock up as much smoke to damage people's lungs. Here, go use this cook stove instead. And the people who are getting the cook stoves are like, why do I need this contraption? The food doesn't taste as good. It's really clunky to load um, wood into it. And they don't use it. Yeah. Well, you know, it was interesting because we, um, uh, when uh, I worked on India stuff, we worked in these villages where the women would put all of their um, their seeds on top of uh, open flame fires. So during the rainy seasons, the seeds would stay dry. So before the harvest started, they needed to keep the seeds dry. So they needed to cook. They needed the open flames in order to keep those seeds dry. So we weren't solving. We were solving for a lung problem, but we weren't solving for their food problem. Yeah. which was a higher priority for them than the lung problem was. Yeah. And so it was an interesting, it's just understanding, it's to your point of if we had tested this and experimented this out, we would have learned a few things. Yeah, and that's a perfect example of the value hypothesis that right. we need to test. And what I would say is that when people really do start focusing on innovation, what tends to be most common is people focus on the value hypothesis, right? So they, you know, things like human-centered design and design thinking, maybe you guys have heard yeah. of. And, um, are, are fairly commonplace. Now, really focus on that value hypothesis. Let's at least listen to our users, our customers, and make sure we're solving a real problem for them. So we're providing something that they actually want. All too often, we're not even doing that. But it's not sufficient just to do that. We also need to think about growth and impact. And I think Lean Impact tries to bring all these pieces together, because it tends to be different organizations and different experts who focus on value through human-centered design, but there's a whole different crop of people who focus on impact and RCTs and so forth, and then a whole different crop of people who focus on business models and policy influence so that for growth. And you end up with these solutions that does one or the other, but not all three, and you need all of them in order to succeed. So you touched on the next question that I have, and then I want to open it up to questions. Um, you know, it, can, it feels confusing sometimes because you have lean impact, measuring impact, metrics to measure impact, randomized control trials, data, uh, evidence-based uh, approaches, all of it can seem somewhat confusing and we tend to get into, okay, so well, in order to understand if that program works, we need to do an RCT uh, or run a different uh, evaluation process. Uh, how do you think about all of it in a cycle? Uh, if I do a randomized control trial, then my program is scalable. Yeah, I th that's a great question. I think it's something that a lot of people grapple with. Uh, the way I think about it is with everything to do with innovation is that we need to tear up. Start small before you get, get big. Um, and that's true when it comes to evidence as well. There's a very big difference between RCTs, which are retrospective, essentially. You come up with something and you're going to retrospectively like verify whether it worked or not, which is, I think RCTs are fantastic and an essential tool to really validating impact to a certainty. But when you're trying to figure out the right solution, RCTs are not the right tool. They take a lot of time, they're really expensive, um, and they're, they're not a good tool to drive decision making. So you need lighter weight tools um, that, that fall more in the data field than the evidence field that get you data, like Summit Public Schools. They got data on student learning assessments on a weekly basis. They didn't prove that X number of students graduated from college, because that would take a long time. But they got assessments, because the students aren't going to learn um, better week by week. They're certainly not going to do better in school over time. And so I essentially liken it to, for in the nonprofit sector, we like to talk about the theory of change, which 
which is basically we have our intervention, here's the different steps that we think will take place in order to lead to the overall impact that we want. And the early stages, we are essentially testing our theory of change, and we're getting data that will be actionable to drive decision making. And you should get, when you gather the data, it shouldn't just be data because these are the numbers that sound good that somebody wants reported to you. You should know what you're gonna do based on the data that you're gathering so that if like Harambe, you know that you want to see 95% retention and you're seeing 50% retention, then you know that if you're at 50%, you're gonna do something about it, right? You're gonna try to dig into the problem, you're gonna realize that's not good enough. Um, and so, you, I think any solution starts out by gathering data that helps you drive decision making, helps you refine and improve your solution, and then over time, once you have a solution that you think works well enough, then you can graduate to more and more levels of rigor, ultimately with an RCT that then may fully validate the, the solution in context. Well, so one point that I just want to emphasize that you made, which I think is super important, is that um, what the data helps us do is to validate and understand whether our theory whether the theory of change we put in is the right set of activities, uh, outputs, things that are happening, and to constantly validate it. And I think sometimes we all tend to write our theories of change and then we just follow the path. Yeah. And we don't validate or test it. We just sort of, that was our theory of change. We promised to do these four activities, which lead to this thing, which will lead to that thing, and then that'll be our outcome. Think of um, it as a sales funnel, essentially, yeah. right? That each stage of the theory of change, you want to optimize each linkage, right? right? So your theory of change is we're going to, offer students a training, or we're gonna offer youth a training. They're gonna come to the training. They're gonna learn something. Then they're gonna get a job. Then they're gonna be retained. Then they're going to have a, you know, career. be able to have a career, be able to support themselves for the rest of their life. Each of those steps you need to optimize, right? So you need to optimize the number of people who hear about this who actually come. And then you need to optimize the number of people who come who actually learn something and then are able to get a job. And then you need to optimize the number of people who get a job who actually stay in the job and so forth. And so the, the data essentially uh, helps us validate the theory of change, but it also, it's not enough to just validate it. We also need to optimize for each of those linkages along the way. Yeah. Um, okay, so questions. I know you guys have questions. 